Hi, I'm Chucky. And I'm your friend to the end. I hate kids. Where are we going? Home. Where's home? I have no idea. Heidi fucking ho. So this guest, we have been very excited to chat with, and the day has come. We're very excited. None other than Jay Tilla, the fucking killer herself, Jennifer <laughs> Tilly. All right, here she comes. Hello, surprise, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so great to see you guys again, and I guess I'll be seeing you very soon in Toronto, in snowy, cold, windy, friendly Toronto. I think I hopefully so. we'll be all right. Hopefully there's no yeah. snow. But, hopefully uh, it won't snow in June, but you never know. You never Those know. Canadians, yeah. they're wacky. <laughs> Certainly not like the Winnipeg experience, though. Right. <laughs> as cold as anything. So I want to tell a quick story, Jennifer, of how you mm -hmm. and I how you and I met. We were both downtown at LA Theater Center doing different plays at the same time and sharing <laughs> a dressing room. What was the name of the play you were in? I think my play was called Boy's Life, and it was a battle between the sexes. John Cryer was in it, and we sort of, uh, it was, we were very obstreperous, and I remember, I think it was your, because we all shared a dressing room, I think your theater uh, group was saying, those girls are too loud, and then we have opposition defiance disorder, so when everyone was like, shh, shh, we were like, well, this is how we prepare. We get really loud. <laughs> so I kind of remember that, but I just thought you were the coolest girl in the world. You're playing a cheerleader. And I actually thought that you were like 16, 17. I guess you were just a dab older than that. But um, I just remember that girl, she's got a certain kind of cool girl vibe. And I sort of uh, was like, oh, I, I would like to be friends with her. What year, what year was this? Oh my gosh, it was like in the 80s. It was 89. It was the, I was doing that play when I got Chucky. Mm. Um, my memory of you is that you had to wear like a bustier and you were in like lingerie for, mm -hmm. and you looked so fucking ridiculously awesome in right. that bustier that when your play ended before mine, I stole it from the wardrobe oh, department. I stole that, the That's what happened to it. <laughs> I stole it because I think maybe I look like Jennifer if I wear this and I did not. Didn't who, work. Out wait, who was the, the um, what was the name of the older lady in your play that she, the me, amazing? Susan Terrell. Susan Terrell. So she was amazing. And she said to me, because that was before the, it's really hard to imagine, Alex, uh, forgive us while we talk a little girl talk, You're but good. that was before they invented the Wonder Bra. And so she said, if you want to get lingerie that gives you cleavage, because I think I was very fond of the thing I was wearing on the show. She said, you go to this place on Melrose called the Underworld. It was called the Undie World of Lily Sancier. And Lily Sancier with a burlesque stripper. And all all those ladies working there were ex burlesque strippers and they knew all the tricks they knew that's basically how I sort of discovered my fabulous um figure my on screen figure it's just all underpinning pinnings and push up and construction I don't think that's entirely true I think you don't give yourself oh. enough credit <laughs> well, yes yeah, there, there's a lot of natural squishiness too but I have to prop it up to make it look good <laughs> So that's how we met, and, uh -huh. I, and, uh, and 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 like I said, that's when I got Chucky. So I also remember the time having dinner with you with Paul Robinson, a mutual friend we have, Alex, at a restaurant on Beverly somewhere, where you told me you were you had been offered Bride of Chucky. Mm -hmm. Remember that meal? Okay, back to the early what? 90s when we had lunch with Paul Robinson. So Paul yeah. was one of my very dear friends and he was like almost best friends with Jason Priestley, your ex. And he said, oh, Jason's girlfriend, she was in one of the Chucky movies and I was trying to decide if I should do it or not. And he said, let's have dinner with her, you and you, you can tell her she can tell you what to expect so I remember I was like oh here I am again sitting next to the coolest girl in the world and you were like 
I don't know. I feel like even if Christine is really excited about something, she'd just be like, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I met Mick Jagger. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, should I do it? I don't know. What do you think? And um, I think Christine had some warnings for me, but I don't remember what they were. I think she said it was hard to work with the public because of all the puppeteers. And um, I don't know, this might be right as embellishment, but me might have been saying like, it's all about Chucky when you're in a Chucky movie. Chucky gets, okay, I, this is right as embellishment, but this is what I've noticed, Chucky gets 27 takes and you know, you get like three. And you're like, oh, I think I could do that with a little more passion. And they go, was Chucky doing everything right? And they go, yes. And they're like, let's move on. But I, I remember it wasn't like, oh my God, you're going to be in the new Chucky movie. This is so exciting. You here, let me let me pass the torch. She was sort of like, well, you know, it's, I, I had a good time. And, you know, it's it. it <laughs> you sound like an asshole. Yeah, you did. You're you not did an asshole, over, but that does sound it. pretty accurate. <laughs> so I found out, is it true uh, that Hill Street Blues was your first job? No, it first? wasn't, but it was uh, my first job. My very first job was a movie called uh, No Small Affair. No, no, no. My first job was a television. Okay, my first job. Now I'm going way back. I was, I had a recurring role on a show called Boone. And it was about the early days of Elvis, but you know, an Elvis-like character. And he was called Boone. And I was in that with Diane Franklin, you know, the actress Diane Franklin, who was in the um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So we were the girlfriends on that. And I kind of didn't understand because I thought I was the most clever, but I was the girlfriend of Rome, Boom's best friend. So whenever they were long, they we were sort of the comedic relief. We weren't really the storyline. They would cut all our banter. And so I would run, and I didn't have that many lines anyway. And I would run and I'd be like, oh, they cut our funny stuff that we did. But that was my, my very first job was, uh, that was actually my second job. My first job was a show called Oh Madeline with Madeline Kahn. Oh, it wow. was a show starring Madeline Kahn. I guest starred on that with Madeline Kahn and Jeffrey Tambor was the other guest star back then. It's wow. kind of funny, like me and Jeffrey Tambor look the same age, <laughs> 35, 40 years later. It's like some people just don't age. I mean, yeah. obviously, Alex, you look very different <laughs> than you did in the well, first from, Andy, movie. from six-year-old Andy, sure. <laughs> yeah, I think when you're as sort of, but I was youngish then. I was in my 20s. Okay, so then my third role was No Small Affair, where uh, me and John Cryer and Tim Robbins played high school students, and Tim Robbins was a high school bully, and Demi Moore played the older woman that Jim, that um, John Cryer fell in love with, and she was a little bit older then than she is now, because I think she might have shaved a couple years off her age, because, you know, when you're 21, you don't need to lie about your age, or 22 or however old she was, yeah. so, but it was, um, that was fun. And then I did a movie called Moving Violations with Sally Kellerman. It was about a bunch of people being chased by a bunch of policemen. And I played a rocket scientist. And I had a sex scene with my co-star in an anti-gravity chamber. Wow. And um, the, my co-star was John Murray, Bill Murray's little brother. And he was really funny. That was, he only did one other movie. I think he um, had a little part in Scrooge, the Bill Murray movie. Yeah. But he was super funny. And But he's he kind of nervous because it was his first movie movie and he's starring in it and uh um actually you know who really likes that movie Quentin Tarantino when I met him he's like oh there's someone I always wanted to ask you and I thought he, I had quite a body of work by then and so I thought he was going to ask me about some of my more intellectual films and he said in that anti-gravity chamber how did you do it and I was looking at him like he was like a little kid that actually believed we were in anti-gravity chamber. And I said, well, we were, you know, we were on wires and then um, and they removed the wires in post-production. He's like, that's how they did it. I always wondered. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you were, you're a weirdo. Yeah, his Tarantino. love for movies is just is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, second to none. Yeah. Or yeah. Second, second to maybe Don, who is another encyclopedia of all things cinema. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Don. Oh, you mean Quentin Tarantino? Yeah. Yeah, he was kind of, he was friends, friends with my sister for a while. So we were all hanging out and he really is that guy. Like he brought over on a date, he brought over, he had the Happy Dice Days board game and the Charlie's Angels board game. And 
And we, we was very excited. We actually had to play it. It wasn't like, hey, look at this cool, funky artifact from the 70s. Like, let's play some games. So I, I remember the first time I met him, because you know, my sister was a big movie star at the time. And she goes, oh, do you want to come to the Ivy with me and Quentin Tarantino? And I brought my friend Shanti and I was like, the Ivy, you know, everyone knows where, that's where the movie stars go. And I was sort of had had some fame, but I put on a very fancy dress and I go, Meg, don't wear a t-shirt and tennis shoes at the Ivy because I'll look overdressed because Meg always, she just like puts on her pajamas or whatever's on the floor and wanders out into the world as part of her charm. But, you know, I was always that sort of, you know, pretentious person like, I got to dress nice. I'm going to the Ivy. So I was wearing my best dress. And I was with my friend Shanti and it was going really well. And I made like kind of a joke, like a joke. It wasn't a very funny joke. So then Quentin Tarantino thought it would be funny or polite to do a big laugh. Like my joke wasn't funny. It might've been snarky, a little bit snarky towards him. I don't know. So he goes, ho, 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 ho. Then he picks up his glass. He had an empty glass and he mined hurtling a drink in my face but the glass wasn't empty <laughs> it was full of water he didn't notice it and my friend Shanti said she saw it in slow motion like in a horror water spiraling across the table <laughs> he hit me with all my makeup and my best dress and do you think he went it went oh my god I'm so sorry he started laughing anymore he goes I thought that glass was empty like it was the funniest thing in the world and it wasn't being mean it's just like he's like weirdly um I'm, I'm gonna say um he's he's a little spectrumy shall we say but he's a brilliant a brilliant actor another movie I did that he loved was Embrace of the Vampire which was sort of I think I worked on it for one and a half days I never even saw the movie but I heard it was very soft core porn like lots and lots of naked female vampires running around so when he said I loved your movie Embrace of the Vampires I thought he was trolling me and I go really he goes yes I got the director's cut <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I love that director. So I think this is why his films are so successful is because he's really in touch with what a, a moviegoer, a avid moviegoer would want to see. He's yeah. not, you know, even though his movies are super brilliant, they get uh, lots of Oscar nominations, but they're just really, really, really fun. Like, for example, um, Django Unchained, I thought personally was a much better movie. Um, they came, another movie came out the same year, which was Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis, which was so serious and so politically correct. You didn't see any of what, of Lincoln, there was only, okay, I'm treading on dangerous territory, but there was only one Okay, I, I, I should probably back up, back up, back away from the window. But I'm just saying it was so politically incorrect. Jang Kwon Chin, I mean, I know it was like Pulp Fiction or whatever, but it really kind of showed the, made you think about the horrors of people owning other people and the brutality and everything that went on there. Whereas um, the Lincoln was just a very noble sort of enterprise. And it didn't really make you think. It was just sort of ponderous, I felt. So- you know, there's several ways to educate people. And, and one of them is to be super entertaining. And I think that that's what Quentin likes to do. And, and this is to get back to Chucky. This is what I feel is amazing. What Don Mancini is doing is sort of traditionally, uh, Horror films are just, you know, good, clean, fun, nubile teenagers get stabbed, people scream, things jump out of the closet, and then you go afterwards and, you know, you go to uh, Ruby Tuesdays and, and have fun. <laughs> but with the Chucky series, I think it's really amazing how Dawn has really, being out, out gay man, has really brought in really positive gay characters in all of his movies, starting from Bride of Chucky, the gay best friend, was one of the most likable characters in the movie. Certainly more likable than Catherine Heigl. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke, Catherine. <laughs> but then, and then Seed of Chucky, he had... Um, <clears throat> He had Don Waters, who's been a huge fan of the Chucky series, and said to me and also said to Don, I would love to get killed by Chucky. And, you know, he has me, had me in the Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky, and I am a little bit of a gay icon. I say humble, I say modestly. But the Ch with know. the Chucky series, I think he's really, the amazing thing is with the relationship between Jake and Devin, is it, it's a whole new generation of 
a whole new audience and people just accept it. And I think in a way that maybe would not have been accepted 15, 20 years ago, you'd have to really play it up. But it was like, oh, Jake is in love with Devin. Oh, cool. You know, they're a cute couple. I hope they make it, yeah. you know? So I think that it's just sort of normalizing gay relationships, which should be normalized and sort of bringing them into the open and, and bringing them in the sunlight. And I think that that's an amazing thing that he did. And he's not preachifying. It's not a gay themed film. Like there's a lot of, every time you go to Sundance, there's always stories about illicit gay relationships and like, you know, or, or how it destroyed people's lives or how they had to, you know, very serious, lots of really wonderful films. But the Chucky series is just like the real world. There's gay people, there's straight people, you know, the kids are all super cool with everybody's um, orientation. And I think that that's a, an amazing thing that he's done. Yeah, it's not about that. You know, mm-hmm. it's, 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 that's a, a factor of, you know, mm-hmm. a happenstance of these characters, but it's not about that. And then, right. anyway, I mean, yeah, I agree. Well, there was a thing about Bound, which Don is kind of obsessed with a, a different movie that I did, is that it was one of the first films where the girls were lesbians, but it wasn't a lesbian movie. They were out to, um, they were going, trying to outwit the mob and they were in love, but they both happened to be girls, but it wasn't about, it wasn't a gay movie. It was a film noir film yeah. and, and that's what it was. And that was the twist a little bit. It's a no. great, it's a great film noir. Film noir mm-hmm. is what you, why I became an actor. I, collected Pulp Fiction novels in high school mm-hmm. and uh, and all those 40s noir films are the classics are my favorites. And it was the re- reinventing film noir. Mm-hmm. I thought that Blade Runner had done that. And that's what mm-hmm. I want to take the torch and do. It didn't work out that way for me, but Bound is exactly the sort of film that I would hope to have made when I and, first- And you do all that wonderful photography. Like your fo- photography is very reminiscent of cinematography and film noir films you know you're and a lot of the pictures like the self-portraits that you did like where you can really see that that is an influence of yours like you do it all those sort of Betty Page type pinups and everything yeah so I, I wanted I wanted to uh, talk, so much I want to talk to you about I, I heard you tell a story about um how you ended up getting bullets over Broadway that you had you wanted to work with Woody Allen and um, yes, mm. and you, were, you were told that you have to be in a, in a play. Right. It's really funny. Like when you go to Hollywood, everybody's like, you should do this. You should do that. I remember my best friend from high school goes, you should work with Patrick Duffy. He's really cute. This that show? He had, was on a show called Aquaman. You should try to be on that Aquaman. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm leaving an apartment that costs $90 a month, a furnished apartment. Don't have an agent. Don't even have my big toe in the door. And I'm like, okay, Linda, I'll get right on that. But I remember my ex-husband, Sam, said, Jennifer, you should be in a Woody Allen movie. He said, Woody is always very good with women, you know, and obviously his movies were the best films. And he said, um, the women in the Woody Allen movies always get nominated for Oscars. So he was sort of saying, if you're in a Woody Allen movie, you'll get nominated for an Oscar. So I called up my agent at that point, I did have an agent. And I said, I want to be in a Woody Allen movie. And they go, oh, it's really hard. And this is before Woody was working with the studio system. And that's why his films were very artistic because he had a group of actors that he liked to work with that he would use again and again. But he did, wasn't under the pressure like, oh, you know, we have to cast Sharon Stone or Bradley Cooper or something like that because box office, because he was sort of an artist making these independent films and kind of plunking them out there. And they did very, very well for, you know and he but he did that box office wasn't really a a big thing back then for him and sometimes he would do these movies that were sort of I called them trifles like they were like those little macaroons or something like half a movie that they were just light and airy and not a lot of substance and then every third or fourth one there would be uh Hannah and her sisters or Manhattan or Annie Hall was one of the greats and um so my agent goes oh he just uses um and New York actors he sees them in plays and that's what he uses you you know he never never really does a casting so I thought I have to go to New York and do a play. So I went to New York and I got in this play, this small play. And then my agent sent my tape over to Woody Allen and said, oh, you know, his casting character, would, would he love to like to come and see Jennifer in this play? He didn't see the play, but he saw my tape and he loved my tape so much. He brought me in to read for Olive. And I was sitting outside in the waiting room with Chaz Palminteri, as it turned out, we were both very nervous and he had seen Chaz in a Bronx tale. 
And um, I said, oh, I didn't, they didn't give me any sides or they didn't tell me what to expect. And he goes, well, some of my friends that go in on Woody Allen movies, it's, uh, they say it's the quickest meeting on record sometimes. He'll just look at them. If he doesn't think they're right, he'll go, oh, um, thanks for coming. And before they know it, they're back on the subway, you know, going back to New Jersey, crying, not knowing what happened. And he said, but sometimes if he likes you, he thinks your possibility, he might give you some pages and ask you to read. And I thought, oh, I, I hope, I hope it's the letter. So I went in and he looked at me and he said, Jennifer, will you read for me? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. He gave me, it was the entire first scene in, in the, there, there's a scene in a dressing room where I'm yelling at my boyfriend. I'm yelling at the other chorus girls. It was 12 pages long. So I'm they're studying it and then I go in and I kept losing my place on the page because it was very dense and I hadn't studied or anything so when I lost my place I would just vamp I'd make up stuff like I'd be like yeah you know get out of my face yeah you never do anything for me you never you're a big stupid and then I'll find the line dumb dumb and I hate you so then I get back to the line but because I'd be interacting with the other actors then obviously I'd lose my place in the script again and I have to make up more stuff and I finished I thought oh my gosh that was awful and I said uh can I do it again and when he goes uh no I think we've seen all we need to see <laughs> I thought I blew it. I go back home. I'm like, oh, I blew my chance. And then I read in the Hollywood Reporter, uh, casting for bullets over Broadway is down to final two for the role of Olive, Jennifer Tilly and Cindy Lauper. I was like, what? Now the Woody Allen people call me. They go, did Jennifer leak this? And they, my, my people, because it talked about the script and everything. They said she never even got the script. She doesn't know anything about the script. She didn't even know she was in the running. It was a couple of weeks since she read before. She's like, why would she leak? How would she, would she know about Cindy Lauper? So then I was thinking I was going to lose it because somebody leaked it. And then I got the part. And uh, it was... Uh, well, I, I lost my train of thought because my little earphone fell out of my ear. So so then I uh, got the part and I was really happy. I had actually a very interesting ending to this story, but I can't remember it because my ear. Um, I think that, um, was it Tracy Ullman? Oh, did it involve Tracy Ullman? Oh, no. Well, Tracy Ullman was up. She got another part in, I know. in the movie. Um, I'm just not going to repeat the story, but, but she, was, yeah. it was between me and Cindy Lauper apparently for yeah. Olive, but I'm guessing that Tracy might've come in to read for Olive also, cause she kind of knew all my lines. <laughs> and then she, she played the, the aunt in you and she was very funny. She brought in her little dog, but it was sort of weird because my ex-husband, Sam had uh, produced the Tracy Ullman show for two years. So I was always to support my husband, Sam, I would always sit in the first row and I watch the shows um, every single week. So of course I'm sitting there like, Tracy Ullman's a genius. So I was a little bit intimidated by her. And um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about, that's all I'm gonna say about Miss Tracy Ullman. <laughs> uh, well, I, I heard you tell a story that when Sam saw Bullets Over Broadway, that he was, um, he did a thing that my mother does with my character, defending all of like Right, right, Olive, right. Which is so sweet. My mother does that too. Any characters that I play that do anything weird, my mother defends them and has all backstory for why it was okay. Right. Well, okay. In the movie, and Sam and I were divorced at that time, but you know, Sam and after Sam and I got divorced, we were really good friends for 30 years and we traveled together and we go to premieres together. And so I got bullets over Broadway and I took, he wanted to see a screening. We went to a screening that I think it had some critics and you know people and there was about nine or 12 people in the movie theater and so he knew how much I'd struggled and how hard it was for me to get a toehold in the industry and you know back then people were like oh she's a bimbo and she has that squeaky voice because I was doing kind of kind of a Maryland thing, which is sort of what I do for uh, Tiffany. So yeah. he really knew how much I struggled to get respect. So when we were watching the movie and everybody was saying, oh, Lou, she's a terrible actor, he would go, you're not that bad. And then when Chaz um, Palmentary Cheech would say, oh, that voice, that annoying voice. And Sam would go, there's nothing wrong with your voice. So then uh, my character, she has an accident and she can't uh, perform in one particular uh, show out of town, out of town tryouts. And uh, my understudy comes in instead for me and she gets a standing ovation. 
And Sam goes, she wasn't better than you. He was genuinely outraged. So Cheech, Chaz Palminteri decides all of this ruining his masterpiece. So he's taking her down to the pier to bump her off. And um, we're watching it and Sam was in horror and he started talking out loud. He's getting louder and louder. He's like, what's going on? Where is he taking you? He's not taking you to the pier. And I'm like, shh, shh. <laughs> and then Chaz goes, Olive, you're a terrible actor. Blam, blam, blam. And I fall into the water. And Sam goes, does this mean you're never going to make it to Broadway? And I go, I'm afraid so. He goes, come on, let's get out of here. I go, but Sam, the movie's not over. And he goes, it is for me. <laughs> we had to leave. He was so mad. I think that's fantastic. That's that so reminds great. me of when I, I did The Getaway with uh, Michael Madsen. And he told me later on, that he, he called his dad. He didn't tell his dad anything that was in the movie. He wanted to be a surprise. And his dad called him up afterwards and goes, how come they all, he goes, how come I, I'll, you're such a good actor. I want you to do a movie where you have a really big part. And he goes, I had a big part in it. He goes, no, you were only in it for about 15 minutes and then you got shot and you died. <laughs> and his dad had got up and left when he got shot and fell down the hill. So he didn't see where um, where Michael Madsen gets up and takes off the bulletproof vest and then goes through the rest of the movie. <laughs> but I love the loyalty. Like if you're dead or you're not in the movie anymore, just sort of a, an outrage, like they sort of see the character as you. Uh, yeah. with the with Chucky the Chucky thing I told everybody oh I don't come in until the fifth episode because I didn't want him to say when's Jennifer coming in but everybody watched him from the beginning I mean they love they look they even love the parts I wasn't in even people who don't like Chucky or don't like violence just really really love the Chucky series uh, unanimously it yeah. seems it was yeah. just so amazing yeah All I right. have questions about the Chucky series okay, okay. um I expected that as the yeah. show is called Chucky <laughs> Talks Exactly. Um, I mean, I have questions going back to, we mentioned Don and, and that uh, time period when you met him. I, I think everybody thinks about Tiffany and Chucky and their dynamic of their relationship, of course, but your real friend to the end from this is Don. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that first conversation you had with him about this and what your perspective of that was. And if you had any hesitate, you mentioned that you were thinking about it, but did you have hesitation about this uh well i'd never seen any chucky movies and then i had a preconception of horror movies as sort of you know the the red-headed bastard stepchild of the movie genre <laughs> And so when I got offered a Chucky movie, I was coming off of my Oscar nomination. You know, I thought I was going to be the next Dame Judi Dench or that's what I aspired to be. And so I really wasn't interested in doing a Chucky movie. And but I, then I got then I got my agent, my manager was really pushing it. And then they uh, they asked me to take a meeting with David Kirshner, the producer. And Don said sort of bitterly, I wasn't invited. Like, I, I think he said, Don said, don't come along. You'll ruin it. Leave it up to me. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I'll, I'll take care of this. So I read the script and the script was very clever and funny. Like I didn't realize Chucky movies were so funny. And then I heard they were getting Ronnie Yu. I had a uh, boyfriend for a while that was really into Hong Kong films so he would take he thought Chinese women were beautiful and he would take me to all these movies and then I was like oh I'm I'm half Chinese because <laughs> he had such a thing for Chinese women so Ronnie you directed many great movies uh, most notable The Bride with White Hair so I thought oh that's very cool I would love to work with Ronnie Yu and they had the cinematographer Peter Powell won an Oscar for Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon and then we were at the um, Bel Air Hotel and he opened up the trunk and the Valley Park was freaking out like, that's Chucky, that's Chucky, had a Chucky doll in the trunk. And he goes, if you do the movie, you'll get one of these dolls, which I actually never did. But later on, when I did see the Chucky, Tony Gardner goes, I think it's really unfair. You don't have a Tiffany doll. I'm like, I don't want one. I don't want one. <laughs> But he gave me a Tiffany doll. He goes, put this in your suitcase. So I took a, I smuggled the Tiffany doll out of, out of Romania. Uh, 
And now it's like great. She has, I actually love Tiffany. I post for her photo sessions with her all the time. She has her own Instagram, Tiffany yeah, great, Baby Star, which I, I do occasionally. And Tiffany, I really get along and I sort of treat her like she's a pet in my house, like a very annoying, uh, self-involved narcissistic child. But anyway, so David Kirshner said I would like sweetening, sweetening the deal. You'll get one of these Chucky dolls. And he was just telling me like what they had in mind. And I just, the more I stopped, thought about it and reading the script and my, a friend of mine goes, you know, if you do the Chucky movie, you'll have a franchise. I always wanted a franchise. And I was thinking at the time, well, you know, Tiffany dies horrifically. I was very unfamiliar with the voodoo in, you know, enchanted doll genre. I say she dies horribly in the first, uh, in the, in the movie. I can't imagine she's coming back. And then of course she came back and came back and came back and came back and came back. And, you know, I was sort of phased out a little bit after Seed of Chucky, Universal said Chucky needs to be scary again. So in Curse of Chucky, that's when they had the whole Nika, brought in Nika and the Nika storyline. And I just came in a dibby dibby dab. I think I worked one day at the end and cracked some jokes and, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm Tiffany. I am mailing something somewhere. Ooh, you'll have to see the next movie to find yeah. out. But I really, when I got called to Chucky, I thought it was going to also be a cameo. And then I thought, wow, this is bigger than a cameo. It's actual an actual part. If you have more than two scenes, it's not a cameo. And it was very integral to the um, to the storyline that what happened with Tiffany and Nika and it set up for Chucky. But I think also with you guys, where he brought you guys back in cult of Chucky, Chucky, I think it was all these tendrils that were going out into the world, being in the theater when you guys came out, the fans just went insane. I mean, it just blew them away. And this is the thing with Don. He thinks if I was a fan, which he is, what would I like to see? That's why we've had seven movies and two seasons of this, because he loves, he's not like, oh, I'm just picking up a paycheck, just slumming. This is why a lot of the movies after the first sequel, the second sequel, they disappear because they just do a retread of the original movie, like the Jaws movie. And they get progressively worse, like when you, uh, showing my age, but when you do a lot of photocopies and the more you make the light paler and less like the original they look so that yeah. that's what I think like was genius like bringing you guys back in it's a connection to the past so we have the whole new generation which is uh the kids you know Ali and mm -hmm. and Devin yeah. and Zach and um mm -hmm. Bjornvin and so, uh, I get, I, I'm talking to, yeah. I'm doing their characters names and their real names yeah, I mix them <laughs> but, up on occasion. but they have the whole new generation but then I love that he brings back the OGs and we all have like these very intriguing storylines also and people have an emotional connection to us because they grew up with us and um, it makes it seem like a real Chucky series like you can slap you can slap Chucky, the name Chucky on any old thing, which um, oh, did. is a point they did. But a lot of times when they do the reboot, like they did the reboot of Dallas or they do the reboots of other TV shows, but they don't have any connection to the past and they just don't succeed because people loved those characters and they don't care that the characters are older. They love those characters. They want to know what's going on with them. Yeah. You know, which is so, so masterful and his ability to do that, to reinvent each time, mm -hmm. kept it around so long, but also stay true to, uh, you know, what the fans love and, and what he's always loved about it. So and what I've noticed, too, is with you guys, with us, with um, Fiona, the kids, everybody always loves Don. That's very, very unusual. On every movie we've done, he's like the great um, captain of the soldiers or whatever. Everybody would do anything for him. I don't think you can meet a single person that says Don is an asshole or, oh, I, I didn't agree. like working with Don. I agree. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. And, and, and we, we love him. We trust him too. Mm -hmm. I say, I say often in Don, we trust. In Don, uh, we trust. <laughs> we do, we do, and that's comforting. Yeah. yeah. This is a sincerity of, he has. Mm -hmm. um, and the, like, I used to always, people will try to copy Aaron Spelling shows and mm -hmm. it's a very jaded perspective. Like, oh, that 90210 show is a big hit. I can make a dumb show about teenagers and, and it wouldn't do well because they mm -hmm. had it from a, from a jaded perspective. Right. Aaron didn't, didn't think he was making corny TV. He thought he was making great art and, and people responded to it as if it were. And I think Don's genuine affection for Chucky and the whole, uh, the whole franchise is so evident and I think it's the, the, the greatest part of why it's has the longevity it does is Don mm. 30. 
Um, and it doesn't seem to diminish. It doesn't seem to get less and less. It's almost just getting stronger and stronger. And yeah. he never talks down to his characters. He's just as excited to see how the, where these shows are going to go as anybody else. He loves the characters. He's always thinking of ways to bring back the old characters. And his respect for actors is he also does what Woody Allen does. He has actors that he likes. And then he brings them back in different roles. Like in Curse of Chucky, I killed Adam Herdig. He was a cop. I slit his throat. And then he comes back in Cult of Chucky as a mental patient that fucks Fiona Dora. I'm yeah. like, I think I killed you like a couple <laughs> years ago. And then also the psychiatrist in the in in Cult of Chucky. Yep, is one of the dads in 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 the in the Chucky series. And you know, and some of the actors that in Chucky season one are coming back as different characters in Chucky season two. So. It's just really nice because us, we we like, we they're unusually harmonious sets and we like working with these actors. And, you know, it's just nice to know that just like when Tiffany dies, it's not the end in a Don Mancini series or a Don Mancini movie. Just because you die in the movie doesn't mean that you're out of the series, which I think is just really, really nice. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I You know, throughout each of those... Uh reincarnations of Chucky and Tiffany. Um, I noticed that, you know, your Tiffany's style evolves a, a bit from mm -hmm. film to film. Right. I'm curious how much of that, you know, you, you, you are an influence on, or if this is something else we just trust well, on. You know, I, I really do like fashion and also to not being a skinny mini, I know it looks good on me. So in the first one, she was a very, she was a goth girl. And yeah. so there's a pretty definite idea of how she would dress. And we had so much fun putting the outfits together. And I did bring some of my own clothes. For example, when I'm trying to carry the trunk down the stairs, I have a black and silver dress. That was a dress of mine that Eduardo Lucero made. And I had like these crystal Gucci slides and that. And then a lot of it was stuff that the wardrobe person had found as well. Like all the patent leather, obviously I don't have that in my wardrobe. <laughs> and then the second one, Seed of Chucky, I was playing Jennifer Tilly, movie star. So I was sort of playing myself, but we did a kind of exaggerated version of Jennifer Tilly. Um, I'm trying, I did wear some of my own clothes in that too. The dress where I'm battering the nanny with the doll. That was one of my dresses. I kind of don't remember some of the others, but I think I wore a lot of my own clothes. The third one, the third one, Curse of Chucky, the wardrobe girl just made a really cool outfit for me. And it was goth. So, okay. So the first one was goth. And the second one, I played mostly myself. And then Tiffany goes in my body. So the second one was sort of advanced movie star. Then the third one where I had a cameo was goth, went back to the original um, Tiffany, but a little bit like how she was if she was a little older. I remember I had this fur coat with all these fox heads dangling down. And, you know, so she was more of a woman, less, you know, a punk girl, but still had that goth sensibility. And then in the fourth one, I, I remember my outfit, Dawn really insisted. I was wearing like a red uh, suit and Dawn kept referencing Carol, the movie, the Woody Allen movie. He wanted me to look very polished and very put together. He wanted her wig to be less Marilyn Monroe and more Kim Novak. Yeah. So he explained it to me because I was like, well, you know, it's not like, you know, it's sexy. But he explained it to me. She's playing a role like Tiffany is in Jennifer Tilly's body and Jennifer Tilly slash Tiffany is playing the character of a responsible citizen because she's going to the insane asylum to pretend yeah. like she's very concerned and everything like that. So it was like masks on top of masks on top of masks. And then he continued that theme in Chucky because... I'm Tiffany is in Jennifer Tilly's body and Chucky is in Nika's body. And I think that was the theme all through the whole movie, even with the kids and with you guys. I, oh, nobody knows who anybody is. Like, do you ever really know anybody? Like, who can you trust? And I think that that was a very interest, interesting thematically. In the new series, I don't want to give anything away, but I think her look is going to change a little bit also. And I yeah. think that that's what keeps people people coming back is that you know it would be very ridiculous Alex if you were dressed the same way Andy Barkley was <laughs> if I love my good guy PJ, huh? yeah and I love it how you show character through your 
<laughs> your PJs with the, the bottom <laughs> that drops out. And then also Christine, like how Christine's like you show the character through the dress is that you're sort of a, a badass, like kind of a vigilante now. And you've got the the leather and the boots that, you know, you've got that don't fuck with me sort of thing going on that maybe you didn't have thir- 30 years ago where you're more like, you know, an innocent girl. Wearing the same hat though. I literally wore in, in Child's Play too, I wear this leather hat that's my hat. I wear my own clothes almost entirely and all this Chucky stuff. Yeah. Literally yeah. Kyle still has that hat I wore. But it. I love that that's a, a touchstone to the past. And like, why is Kyle, why is she so attached to that hat? Like, what does it mean to her? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe never know. <laughs> and, and, and he also uh, wore it as uh, Emily Valentine, right? I did, yeah. Which I, did. I have to point out, you know, is there is there something to the fact that uh, Emily Valentine and Tiffany Valentine share a name? Mm-hmm. I would, that is very that. interesting. We're pushing that on Dom. I hope I'm hoping that Don <laughs> that, 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 that Tiffany says like, oh, I've got a crazy cousin named Emily. You know? Oh my God, that would be very cool. I love that. Well, Don loves to have like the multiverse thing going on. Like there's different things that are sort of overlapping and, and interacting and, you know, real people kind of wandering in and wandering out. And he does like homages to other films that he loves. And yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I wouldn't, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he put something like that in there. <laughs> <You thought? laughs>